Last week, we began to look at what I call the nature of reality. And if there was ever a need for reality in the world, it is now. Amen. We've been doing this study of prophecy for the last three years because uh, along with COVID, there has been so many changes in the world. And it only gets worse and worse and worse. The anti-Semitism, we're going to talk about that. That's an indicator. We know that that is coming upon the nation of Israel. We don't want it to. But that's what prophecy says is going to happen. So we're going to look at a couple of verses that we began with last week. Second uh, Timothy 4.3 and 2 Thessalonians 2.3. And this is session 2. 2 Timothy 4.3. For the time will come. Remember, Paul's talking to Timothy, a young minister that he's taken under his wing. He's about how, how he should deal with the churches. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. People go to churches because that church tells them the things they want to hear. Now that's not how a mature Christian does it, but that's that's what's going on in the end times. And Second Thessalonians 2-3, we've talked a lot about this. The great falling away, the great apostasy, uh, the church let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, that is the rapture of the church, the catching away of the church, will not happen except there come a falling away first. In other words, the church is going to believe sound doctrine, but they're going to move then to not sound doctrine. And that's going to be a sign, that's going to be an indicator that we're at the end of the end times. And we're seeing that in America today. So, and I want to run through this real quickly because some of you weren't here last week. And this is really important because this explains, this tells you the reality of things. How can the world, college campuses, as we've seen them, be filled with people who support Hamas? Now, if you don't know what Hamas did I don't know how to school you on it. I could tell you, go watch some of the videos. Uh, Hamas and the terrorists wore body cameras, and, and we have the pictures of what their cameras show they did. And frankly, as I've told you, there are things I have seen them do that I wish I could unsee. I would never have believed. I'm not even going to describe it for you. It's so bad, but how could these kids on college campuses and these big crowds gather to support Hamas? How is that possible? Well, the word is intersectionality. We talked about this back with Black Lives Matters. Back then, you may recall that. What is intersectionality? Dictionary definition. Now, I'll give you the definition, then I'm going to give you a picture that will help you understand the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as class, race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and independent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. Now, there's a lot there to take in. This describes it. This shows it. So this shows how you can figure out who you are. Let's say you're black. Let's say uh, uh, you're a woman. Uh, let's say you live in America. Let's say you're poor. All of those things together show you the point at which you are the victim. You are victimized by those things. The fact that you're a woman. You know, and hey, nobody appreciates that I was born a man more than me. Amen. Women have it so much harder. Lives so much harder. But in America, with this kind of mentality, if you're a woman, you are one of the oppressed class if you're black and and on and on now that works both ways right if you are let's say you're let's say you're white 
let's say you're an American. Let's say you're a man. Let's say you're a Christian. That means this is the point then at which you are the oppressor. The ultimate oppressor is a white male Christian in America. That's the epitome of the worst kind of oppressor. And that's how that easily understood. You've got these two groups of people. Either you're an oppressor or you're one of those who is oppressed. Now this I explained back at Black Lives Matters because that's the mentality they come from. If you're black, you're the oppressed. If you're white, you're the oppressor. Now the other details don't seem to matter. Just that's true. This intersectionality that's been taught in our, our colleges for several decades now it's all about you figuring out how you're a victim. Now, if you figure out, okay, I'm a man, I'm white, I'm a Christian, I'm an American, I'm the oppressor. For me to understand that is what it means to be woke. I have now woke up that I'm the problem. And I can begin to address that. I don't, I'm, I don't think you really ever can. You can't. In their mind and their thinking, you can never fix your problem. You are that the problem. This is the reason now. Black Lives Matters was then, but now we come fast forward to Hamas versus Israel. Hamas is portrayed in the press. I'm sure you've heard this. They this is a resistance movement. They're not terrorists. They're not people who cut babies out of women's womb while they're alive. They did that, put tape over their mouth so they couldn't scream. That's Hamas. How you get to the place where you support Hamas, Hamas is a resistance movement. They're not terrorists. They're the victims. Israel has victimized them. You see how that works. So, there's a little... There's this guy, Yaakov... Shweeki? He's famous in Israel. He's a great singer. I don't know him. But I was watching uh, somebody this week, and he showed this, and I, I thought this would be... So the guy's not a believer. He's not a believer. He's a, a Jew, okay? And he sings a song that's entitled, We Are a Miracle. And it really does a, a good job of taking you through the fact that Israel really is... A surviving miracle. And this is a great song. And I don't I've got the closed caption on. I hope that that helps you. Israel must be wiped out. And Jews. Here my ship. Every day we fight a battle. On the news we are stars. And history repeats itself and makes us who we are. Chosen with love and 
biblical song yeah. you know God's the one that chose them on the other side of that is the Jews according to Paul in the book of Romans their problem is they're proud that they're the Jews that's a problem but they would exist only because of God Amen. right if, if you want an interesting study just go to the web and find all the contributions that have been made by Jewish people to the world I'll just give you one name and it has, it has developed our reality scientifically. Albert Einstein. And that's just one. But there are hundreds of contributions the Jews have made to the world. Our understanding in the world really is shaped. And, and so you've got Hamas, Islam. Islam at its core, everything about the Koran is hate. Everything is hate. In the Quran, they are told that if you're a Muslim, it's okay for you to befriend an infidel so you get a chance to stab him in the back. That's hatred. Islam is hatred. Now, I'm not spewing hate. I'm telling you what they believe. What Hamas did they're really just being consistent with the, with Quran. The rest of the Islam in the world, they're not consistent. They're not following through with what is said in the Quran. Hamas is doing that. It is hatred. 
on the other side of this, you've got, you really got two people in the world, two peoples, if you will. America and Israel have a moral core yeah. off which they operate. So Hamas will go in and do unspeakable things because they have no moral base. Israel will be careful. For years we've known they have the knock-knock when they do their... So when they know that there's a bad thing going on in Palestine, they notify them and tell them, we're blowing up that building because of what you're doing in the basement. And you've got 15 minutes to get everybody out of the building. Who fights a war like that? They have a moral core. So this is not a... They're not playing on equal terms is really my point. So... We're studying prophecy. We're looking at reality. And of course, God's the one that defines what is real. Why does he give us information before it happens? Why does he give us prophecy? Uh, and I'm going to run through these real quickly. I gave these to you last week, but a lot of you weren't here. It's really good stuff. Uh, in his book, Waking the Dead, John Eldridge made a statement about John 10.10. 10. One of my life verses. Probably the first verse I ever memorized. One of the first few. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That would be Satan. I am come, Jesus said. Did you get that? I am. Right? The name of God. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So Eldridge referenced that passage and he made a great quote he said by all means god intends for you to have life but right now that life is opposed it doesn't just roll in on a tray there is a thief he comes to steal and kill and destroy in other words yes the offer is life but you're going to have to fight for it because there's an enemy in your life with a different agenda there is something set against us. We are at war. Jesus wants you to have abundant life. Satan wants to steal that. That's why the Bible tells us to put on the full armor of God. Yep, it's a, it's a battle. It's a battle yeah. And we've talked about this in the last few weeks. When, when people come to the Lord, I always try to make them understand that now that they have come to the Lord and accepted Jesus as their Lord their master, and their savior, the devil is not happy with their lives now. Oh, and it's war. Yeah. Because a lot of people, I think, come to Christ thinking, well, this will fix all my problems. All my problems will go away and everything will be good. Roses and sunshine. You know, it's not that way. Well, we are at get, war. If Satan couldn't get to your mind and influence you, you'd be good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but he does. So, Let's consider very quickly the four reasons I gave you why people don't study prophecy. There are very specific reasons. Number one, Bible prophecy is too hard, too confusing to understand. This is the lazy believer. Number two, reason why people don't study prophecy. Bible prophecy has nothing to do with my everyday life. It is in a, the future and does not address my needs now. This is the selfish or immature believer. It's all about me. Prophecy's not going to help me to know it. I need to pay my bills and I need to get along with my spouse and etc. Selfish believer. Three, it is too scary. This is the weak or the faithless believer. Number four. It is not important as long as I believe that God wins. This is a believer who does not believe God. <clears throat> All right. So six benefits. Why should we study prophecy? What will it do for me? I began to give you these. Number one, prophecy plays a leading role in the New Testament. The bulk of the Bible is prophecy. Now, some of it has already happened. Prophecies about the coming baby in the manger, okay? But the bulk of the Bible is prophecy. And the New Testament, 
For every prediction about Jesus' first coming, there are eight that relate to his second coming. I mean, just on a simple basis, a one to eight ratio, how important would you say is prophecy to God? Eight times as much as his first coming. Revelation 19.10, at, at the end of it, and John has this experience where he's just overcome with the deed to worship. And I fell at his feet to worship him. He's not talking about God. He's worshiping this angel. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for, and here's what I want you to notice. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's how important it is. Number two benefit. Prophecy proves the integrity of Scripture. I mean, I, I, you probably get tired of this, but I don't ever get tired of thinking about it. The little town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. That's the name of the town. House of bread. Who was Jesus? He was the bread of life. So, who is able to get an entire town named the way he wants it to be for his son to be born in hundreds of years before the child's going to be born? Only God. And that's just, that's just one thing. There are prophecies all over the place that will just knock your socks off. Number three, prophecy protects us from false teaching. If you understand what prophecy says, it will protect you from those people who are prophesying things that are wrong. For example, back when Trump's election didn't work out the way that a lot of these guys on YouTube said that it was going to, I don't know whether you're aware of it, but there were these charismatics that were on YouTube all over the place that were predicting just gigantic things about Trump being elected. Trump's going to be elected, and here's what's going to happen. Well, it didn't work out that way. They showed themselves to be prophetic liars. Okay, so I can look at that and I can say, that's a false teacher. So Jesus said, Matthew 24, 4, and Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no man deceive you. This is the first thing. So for those of you who don't know it, many of you do, but let me go back for those of you who don't know it. Jesus told the disciples one day when the disciples said, look at this temple, how beautiful it is. Jesus said, you think that's beautiful? One of these days, not too much in the future, the temple is going to be destroyed. Flat, not one stone on top of the other. And the disciples said, okay, tell us when shall these things be? I mean, this was, you can't believe how this knocked their socks off. And so Jesus sat down with them on the Mount of Olives, and the first thing he told them about prophecy, don't let anybody deceive you. Now, I take from that the simple fact, there's going to be a lot of people trying to deceive you. And so prophecy helps us not be deceived. 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul talking to Timothy, he said, Now the Spirit speaketh very precisely, expressly, that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. He's talking about church people giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I, we, we've talked about it, and I haven't got time to go into it now, but there are gigantic churches in, in, in the world, and particularly in California, who there are false teachers and they're literally bringing in these seducing spirits, these doctrines of devils. Tarot cards in the church, they have a spiritualized tarot card. That's just one thing. Reason number four that you ought to study prophecy, it benefits us in that prophecy prepares us for the days that are coming. Hebrews 10, 10, 24 tells us, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now, why would you need to provoke me to do the right thing? 
Why would you need to prod me to love and good works? Because we need to be prodded. We need each other. Yeah. And when you see me not acting in love or in good works, I saw I saw the back of a pickup tonight coming over to church. I love this. I, I like I need to get this. It was on the license plate. And you had to notice it. It wasn't really big. It said, Nobody cares, work harder. Well, that's great. <laughs> Nobody cares about your complaining and griping work harder that's a pretty good message for the church Amen. stop whining about it Amen. yeah life is hard and it's getting harder in america for christians work harder okay Keep you focused. yeah so i want to give a little parenthesis here we need to be prodded to do the right thing the last days in America. I believe, and I don't know how you'd argue with this, we have reached a tipping point and inflection point in America. Both Israel and the United States are never going back. Amen. We've reached an inflection point, a tipping point. Somebody said, I was talking to Jan Markell this week, and I forget who it was, whoever was talking to him. He made a statement that made me step back and say, well, wait a minute. Is that true? Here was his statement. He said, Israel is the most gay-friendly nation in the world. I had to take a step back and analyze it, figure out it's absolutely true. What's going on in Tel Aviv? They are an LGBT city, and that's the premier city in Israel. And all through Israel, a lot of the stuff that we saw this last summer that was coming against Bibi was coming from the LGBT community. It was coming from the left, and that's the same thing. See, there's only one thing worse than LGBTQ plus whatever, and that is an LGBTQ plus sympathizer. There aren't that many LGBTQ you know, 1%, 2%. But those who have become sympathizers, they're on a mission. Yeah, and that's worse. That's America. That's Israel. I would only argue that, that America may be just as gay as Israel. Now, that being said, why would God's judgment not be on us? I just put you to one illustration. God is the God of the object lesson. That's why I do that with the children. That's how you teach an object lesson, Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the biggest object lesson in the Bible. That's how God feels about homosexuality. Now, you can say I'm spewing hate speech if you want to. I'm just agreeing with God. So, We've reached that inflection point. Look at what Jeremiah 7.16 says. Therefore, pray not thou for this people. God tells Jeremiah, don't you pray for Israel. Wow. Neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession for them, for I will not hear thee. America has reached that inflection point that Israel reached when he carried them into Babylonian captivity. Amen. We're right there. Now, I know this is not the message that you usually hear in churches. It's all about love. It's all about cotton candy Christianity. But I'm, this is the Bible. God loved us. That's, why he told us this. That's exactly right. Ezekiel 14, 12. <laughs> The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously. You see, there are some sins that are not grievous. Some sins are worse than others. Now, they'll all put you in hell. So there's that. But there are some sins worse than others. I hate to use the example, but it fits. It's far worse for you to shoot me 
than it is for you to lie to me. Okay? At least from my perspective. <laughs> right? So not all sin is not the same. And if you factor into that unnatural sin, so there's that. So when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, so we're beyond normal sin, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it, and I will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three... Now, this is an astounding statement. God says to Jeremiah, Though these three men, if Noah, Daniel, and Job, three giants, if these three giants were in America wouldn't do any good. God would save Noah, Daniel, and Job and kill all the rest of them. I mean, that's a lot to take in. God says, don't pray for them. They're past it. Judgment is coming. So, Brother Doug, that, that, brings, up, that brings up a good point because when we... When in, in our prayer time earlier, uh, you know, you we got the title on there for, uh, for government and, and president and stuff like, and and you know, for the for the last several years, for me anyway, makes me wonder why I ought to pray for our president or even our government, because it just seems like there 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 is nothing that you can absolutely that's going to change anything around. So. Sometimes you pray for someone, and sometimes you pray about someone. Yeah. I prayed tonight for my president that he would fail. And for everybody in Congress that would do righteousness for them to prevail, and all those who would do ungodliness for them to fail. Absolutely. So that's how you pray for the leaders. Reason number five, we've got to hurry because it's 8 o'clock. Prophecy provides practical guidance for everyday living. David Jeremiah said this statement I thought it was great. It would not be an exaggeration to say that Bible prophecy drives evangelism and righteous living. Why I live righteously, and I'm not perfect, I'm not saying that, but why do I try to do the right thing? Why do I try to live right? Because I know what's coming. And why do I tell people about Jesus? Because it's coming. That's the spirit of evangelism. Second Peter 3.11 Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Reason number six, benefit number six, prophecy promises spiritual blessings. Did you know that? In Revelation 1, 3, it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. You don't even have to be a Christian. You don't have to be a believer. You'll get a blessing by reading God's word. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And again in Revelation 22 and 7, at the end of it, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. So, those are the reasons why we study prophecy. Newspaper in one hand, Bible in the other hand. Amen. And they are meshing up like never before in my lifetime. Amen. So, study your Bible. Absolutely. It'll get you ready for what's coming. 